Hey, First Family, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What a joy it is to be back with you. You know, I woke up this morning about 6 o'clock, and it was like Christmas morning, man, let me tell you. I was so excited. I was like, hey, you know what? Today is the day we get to go to church, and I get to preach. It was really exciting getting up this morning, and, and I hope it's exciting that you're here today. And if you're joining us online, or if you're watching us, I want to thank you for joining us as well. So, when we get to this passage, we are embracing the notion that we're not, this is not being lifted out of the whole context of 1 Thessalonians. In fact, one of the things that I want to challenge you to do today is read verses 1 to 12 for your lunchtime. Sometime this afternoon, read the whole section because all of it belongs together. But unfortunately, if I'd preached the, the first 12 verses as one talk, you'd been here until about 1.30, even starting the service at 10. So really, I'm helping you. All right? So I want to encourage you to recognize today that our God intends this message to be conveyed to you. And what is that message? Quite simply, it's this. Walking with purity is reflected in how we live our lives. Notice what I said. Not what we do, why we do it. Those two are not the same. Walking with purity reflects the change that has taken place in my life. And that this process that stands over my head every week, death, burial, and resurrection, has brought new life to me that has changed everything. I'm never going to be the same that I was before, all because of what Jesus did in me. And my life has been changed, reshaped, and radically reformed. Can I tell you why the church struggles? Not our church, but the global church. Why the church struggles? Because we've made church religion. It's a list of rules. It's a, a, a manner. It's something we do, but we reserve it for Sunday. What I want to say to you today is this. When the church finds her feet and the fullest expression of her calling, when she becomes the unstoppable force that I believe Jesus wants her to be, it will be because we stop doing and we start being the church. That's the talk that we want to have today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Stand with me as we read from the word of the Lord, whether you're here in person or watching us on live stream. I want to encourage you to recognize the power that is inherently contained in God's word. Now concerning brotherly love, you had no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Let's pray together. So Lord, today, we've gathered to hear from you. We have seen and heard so much already, Lord, that has drawn us into a, a deeper connection with you. We have proclaimed with our voices, Lord, that fear has no place in our hearts and our homes and that we need not let it be the governing factor. And now we have heard from your word that brotherly love is what is our highest calling, what we're supposed to be about, who we are to be. I pray now, Lord, that the purity that you've called us to, the purity of love and the purity of our devotion for you will govern not only this moment, but all of our lives as we go from here. Gracious Jesus, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, let's just jump right in. I want to encourage you, go to uversion.com on your, on your computer or go to the Bible app on your phone and you can pull down today's notes. You can find it right there. I want to jump right in. Here's where, here's where we start. My highest expression of loving Christ is by loving others. So if I want to reveal how much Jesus has meant to me, the best way I can do it is by loving somebody else. It's easy to love Jesus. He's perfect. There's nothing wrong. There's no issues. He doesn't have any drama. 
But these messy people over here, the ones that are difficult to love, and let's be honest, we all belong in this category, amen? Well, I'll take that as an amen, even if you're not willing to say it out loud. Because let's be honest, we're all messy. We have our drama, we have our issues. And yet, if I want to show the greatest amount of love that I have for Jesus, I do it by loving others. This is the word from 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. Brotherly love, he says. Now, as a cowboy fan, I always struggle with this verse. In Greek, the word is Philadelphia, literally. I hate the eagles. Can I just proclaim that? Anybody with me? A couple of you, I'll take that. And if you're waving online, thank you for joining me in my deploration of the team there. But the name of the city is exactly what Paul is calling us to. A deliberate, passionate choice that says I'm gonna act on behalf of these messy people and I'm gonna love them, not because they're easy to love, not because it's simple, not because it's clean, not because it's neat or easy, but because I love Jesus and that's who he died for. And because Jesus died for them, I'm gonna give my life for them too. Even if they don't want me to, even if they didn't ask me to, even if they're not grateful for that, I'm going to love them and I'm going to serve them because that's who Jesus has called me to be. See it again in verse nine. Concerning brotherly love. This is the method that wins people to the gospel. Because here's what we reflect same thing you saw in the, the, this video just a moment ago. First John chapter four says it best. We love not because we loved God, but because he loved us first. So when I have brotherly love for these messy, stained, jacked up people, it is because Jesus has loved me and freed me from the issues that I had beforehand. I've been redeemed, I've been set free. My life isn't like it was before. And if we have ever needed this, it is now. There is more reason to be divided, more reason to be pushed apart, more reason to be cut off into our tribes and our groups and our news media. God bless them, they have a job to do, I understand that, but that's exactly what they're selling. They want division because it drives clicks, it drives views, and it, it's, it's what stirs anger. And if they can keep us all stirred up on their agenda, then we will never get to this point. Never. So we have to decide which is going to be the compass for my life. Is it going to be what I think based on my agenda or my thoughts or my philosophy or what Jesus is calling me to be? I might not can have both. I might have to choose just one. Well, I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, you can choose whatever you want. I can't choose for you, but I can choose for me. And I'm choosing to let this be the governing factor of my life. And if you're one who wants to follow Christ, I think you better as well. I call you to a new ethic today. One that says walking with purity means loving others. Doesn't mean self-righteousness. Doesn't mean that it's easy. It doesn't mean they'll be grateful for it. It means that my calling is to be like Jesus. And that means that a love given will reveal a love received. I want you to see this. You have no need to anyone to write for you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Where did we learn to love these messy, broken people? We loved it because Jesus loved us when we were messy and broken too. So when you look out your window and you see these people who are stained, who are messed up, who have made mistakes, who have a, a broken past, then recognize Jesus died for them just like he died for you. So instead of hanging back and saying, you know, if they would just get their act together, I could love them. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't wait for you to do that? Let us instead proclaim that we will be like Jesus. Let us proclaim that we will love, not because it's easy, 
not because it's simple, not because it's neat, but because we have been loved. There's nothing we could do to earn the, the love and favor that God has shown to us through Jesus. There's no amount of good deeds you can do, no amount of wonderful thoughts, no amount of prayers, no amount of offerings given to a church or a nonprofit, no amount of meals served or amount of hours put in in community service that can ever measure up to the grace that has been given to you through Jesus. Instead of trying to gain God's favor, how about this? Receive it as the gift that Jesus gave you and let it transform your life and then show others what you've received. What would that do to us? What would that do to your home? What would that do to your life? I'm asking this sincerely because I want us to recognize we are headed into a season. We're not in it as far as we're going to be. We're headed into a season where division and anger and animosity, harsh words and cruel intent are going to become more and more prevalent. Well, what makes you say that, Darren? Are you a prophet? No. I'm just looking down the road at November. If it's like this in July, what's it going to be like at the end of October? I want to decide now what we're going to be then. Because if I have to wait and decide then, the pressure gets hot. Emotions get high. Things happen and people say things they wish they could take back. I want to get you ahead of that. I want to get me ahead of it by proclaiming now that I'm going to focus on the love that I have been given, not because I had earned it or deserved it, but because Jesus gave it to me anyway, in spite of myself. And so because I've been so loved, now I can afford to love these messy people. But Darren, it gets hard to do that. Yeah, that's why Paul includes verse 10, a reminder that you're going to need something to sustain you. Let me read verse 10 again. For that love indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers, and he doesn't just limit it to males, it's reflected as a patriarchal statement, but he means all of them, believers, throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. The idea of repeating I called it the paradox of gaining by giving. The only way that I can get more of love that I need to sustain me from Jesus is to give more away. So as fast as I give it away, by loving these messed up, broken people, I can receive more. Call it the multiplication factor. Call it the capacity that we have to receive something that we didn't deserve and yet we can pass on just the same. Let's take this home, shall we? Loving people is a messy affair. But Jesus died for those difficult and messy people. And because he died for them, I can afford to take the good news of the gospel to them without fear. Many years ago, Charles Spurgeon, a famous pastor in London, was asked by a student, he was asked, well, what do I do if one of these profligate sinners, these broken people, these messed up, mistake-ridden people comes to my church? He said, you recognize that Jesus loved you in the same state and welcomed them just the same. Life is filled with messy people and mistakes. Let's love them anyway. Here's the second part to it, and this, this part is the more difficult. Listening to others is the beginning of loving them. Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool delights in airing his own opinion. A 
truer word I cannot recall for where we are as a culture right now. Everybody's opinion counts the same, right? No. Some opinions are wrong. Some have no merit, some have no facts, some have no strength. And yet, if we treat all of them equally valid, we're going to find ourselves in the ditch. Well, who's the arbiter, Darren? You? No, the Word of God is the arbiter. This is the truth I will use to divine between falsehood and truth. When I have to decide, I'm not going to trust my own emotions. I'm not going to trust my philosophy. I'm not going to trust my training or education. I'm going to trust the Word of God to reveal it to Not only that, even if I disagree, I can love that person by listening. I belong to a scholar's guild, and it's a bunch of crackheads. Let's just be honest. And these guys, we, we belong to the scholar's guild, and I go only periodically because, quite frankly, it's difficult. You don't have to belong or you don't have to believe the Bible is true to belong, to belong to this group, and that's a struggle for me. Why would you bother studying the Bible if you don't believe it's true? I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it. But you know what? I know this. When I sit down for coffee, and I just listen to one of these men talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, I get the opportunity to show them what Jesus has done in my life in a way that I could never argue them into. Listening is the gate key to people's hearts. You want to show them the truth of the gospel, start by listening. Now, that doesn't mean that you go along with what they're saying to you, but you can certainly listen and love them enough to hear them. Well, what if they're screaming at me, Darren? then listen to the screaming because sometimes that's the only way it comes out. Well, what if, what if they need to be argued into silence? You know, that's a great question and there are times for debate, but let me just be honest enough to say this, Facebook probably isn't it. If you're trying to argue somebody into a particular line of thinking through Facebook, you're wasting your time. Set that aside. I want to encourage you instead to use opportunities and platforms like that to demonstrate the love of the gospel. Well, what if I don't agree with them? What if they're wrong? What if they need to be argued in it? You know what? It's an amazing capacity that we have. We can walk away. You don't have to engage in every fight. It's an amazing thing that on my phone, I can just scroll and move right on past it. I don't have to stop and argue. You know, my dad told me some years ago, Darren, if you stop and you listen to every donkey in the pasture as you walk past, you'll never get to where you are wanting to go. Now, you can take that however you like, but this is the way I, I regard that. If I stop and listen to every opinion offered to me, regardless of who's offering it, then I I'm probably not going to be able to hear the voice of the Lord calling me toward him. And I'm going to get distracted. And I'm going to get dissuaded. And I'm not going to be able to love each other because I'm going to get so swept up in the emotion and the opinion around me that I'm going to forget why I got called in the first place. Don't let that happen to you. Instead, let your heart and your mind be set on loving and listening with an idea of loving them into the gospel. Let's move on to the second thing. Walk properly before God and humanity. Now when I say walk, I want you to see what I mean by that. There's a lot of different ways you can walk, okay? You can just kind of meander along, and that's a walk. You can kind of inch along, and that's a walk. You can take long, purposeful steps, and that's a walk, or you can walk diligently, directly, with purpose and intent on a path and a mission. When you see somebody walking on a mission, you recognize it because of the way they're walking. I want to encourage you to recognize in verses 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul lays out how, how do we 
put this being of loving one another into action. What does it look like? So he gives us four things, and I'm going to walk through these real quickly, four things in these two verses to say, here's what it looks like to love and to reflect love. Here's the first one. Live quietly. I want you to see verse 11, and it says it right there clearly. To aspire to live quietly. Now, some will say, but if I'm quiet, Darren, I'll get passed over. This isn't a statement about ambition. Moreover, it's not a statement about how we should live every aspect of our lives because we're called to proclaim boldly and powerfully. Rather, this is a statement about quietness of heart, quietness of mind, an inner peace that allows the Spirit of God room and capacity to move me from where I was to where he wants me to be. Live quietly. It means that I don't have to stand up and, and proclaim what I think and what I believe at every corner because I have it settled already in my heart. And that anchor point that I've fixed myself to allows me the peace to live quietly. Now, this is very different. And let me just say, highly countercultural to what we're doing, to who we are as a people right now, not just in the United States, but in the world. Our desire, however, is not to fit in. It's to be transformed. And a part of that is living quietly. The second part of it is one that is, whoa, man, where Paul goes from, from preaching to meddling, as my grandpa used to say. I aspire and, to aspire to live quietly, Paul says, and to mind your own affairs. There were then, as now, a great many busybodies interfering in affairs of others and getting themselves and others into trouble. In 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul calls them out. Peter does the same in 1 Peter 4. Those who are busy pursuing Christ, however, don't have time to meddle in other people's affairs. Sometimes it even happens at the church. We cloak it in churchy language and we say, well, we're just wanting to pray more intelligently. While that may be true in some contexts, I want to encourage you to recognize that when Paul is calling us to mind our own affairs, he's essentially saying, take care to guard your own heart first. At the end, when we stand before Jesus, we will not answer for how someone else lived their lives. We'll answer for how we lived ours. That's why he's calling us to mind our own affairs. When we come to a place where we recognize a shortcoming in someone else, then let us fall back on Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let me read it for you. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up, or as the King James has it, edifying one another as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Mind your own affairs. Now, when he moves on to the last part of verse 11, he says, work with your own hands. In other words, let this be the means by which you are provided. Now, this is a, a key statement culturally. When Paul writes this to the Greeks, he's saying something anathema to them. He's, he's reflecting a work ethic, but he's also saying something about their future because the Greeks hated manual labor like nothing else. They regarded it as something only for the slaves. And yet here Paul is saying, work with your own hands. Here's why. Paul knew the power of labor and the freedom it can provide. There's at least four things we get when we work with our own hands that, that things happen around us. And I'm not just talking about working literally with your own hands, but generally working on your own, having a work ethic that moves you forward. Four things. One, we provide for our own families. We allow God to use our energies and our efforts to provide for those around us. Secondly, to provide for those in need. When I work with my own hands, 
chances are good I'll have something that I can share with those in need. Maybe it's not money, maybe it's something else, but at least it's something that I can provide for them. Here's the third thing. We can provide for our own needs, not just our family, not just others, but for our own as well. And finally, we can honor God with the gifts he's given us. So because God has given us so much and because he's given us the strength to keep going, to work with our hands, and we have something we can offer when Sunday comes. Or even if it's not on Sunday, when it's time to make an offering. Finally, in verse 12, Paul sums it up. And I've entitled this section, Declare Your Dependence. Normally, we want to say declare your independence, but I think it's a little more intuitive, if you will, than that. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one, verse 12 says. When we see verse 12, what he's challenging us to is a God-focused life that invites others to observe. And thus, I'm declaring my dependence on God to sustain me through that. I can't do this on my own. If you leave me to my own devices, I'll fall into the ditch and it won't take long. No, instead, no, I'm going to walk with Christ. I'm going to walk with him guiding my steps. I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to transform me. And I want you to do the same. And where does that begin? It begins with a simple prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, transform me. Now, I'll warn you, that may change your life. I'll warn you, that may change your home. I'll warn you, it may change your marriage. It may change your work life. It may change everything because transformation, when it comes, it doesn't limit itself to one quadrant. So if you're trying to keep God in his God box, in this space that you've built for him because he's safe when he's there, then he's going to bust out of that when you pray that prayer. And yet, what's the, what's the other side? You will find freedom and peace that you cannot find anywhere else. Look around us. We see people everywhere scared to death, worried, terrified about what the future might look like. How long will this season go on? I don't have the slightest notion, but I know this. The same God who was in charge back in February before all this started, he's the same God that'll be in charge when it's all over. And I want to walk with him through it. I don't know how deep or dark this valley is going to get, but I know that I'm holding his hand. And so whether it's easy or hard, my dependence upon him allows me something that others don't have. You need it too. Let's take it home. Just a couple of things in closing. If you want to change the world, change begins in your heart and mind first. Hear a lot of people saying, Let's use this season. Let's use this moment. I couldn't agree more. Let's use this season by letting the Spirit of God change me. Finally, change comes when I choose to allow Christ's transformation in my heart. When I stand back and I take my hands off and I say, Jesus, this is all yours as messed up and broken as I am, I don't know why you would want me, but I'm yours. Do with me what you will. Transformation takes place. So let's get down to the invitation now. What does that mean for you? What does it mean for your home? Let's cut it to the chase. Maybe, maybe today's the day that the Spirit of God is speaking into your life. And the Spirit of God is saying to you, this is your day. This is the reason that I created you, that you might hear me calling you. Maybe this is the day that 
the Spirit of God has awakened something in you, that he's caused you to say, oh my, I didn't know that was even an option. My prayer for you is that right now you'll engage and pray with me, won't you? Whether you're here in person or you are watching us If you're one who is struggling with finding peace and strength, if you're one who has never encountered Jesus and you don't even know how to begin, then here's what I want you to do. Take out your phone and text the name Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, to 315-0092. We've got ministers waiting to hear from you right now. They're sitting at computer stations right here in the church, hoping, praying that you will respond. You're not a burden. This is why we exist, to help people take the next step in their spiritual life. If you're one who is saying, I need to meet Jesus, today's your day. Text the name Jesus to 315 zero zero nine two perhaps you've already met jesus but you're stuck in the ditch and you emotionally physically ethically every capacity you have is tore up by this this moment that we're in here's what i want you to do same thing text the name jesus to three one five zero zero nine two and let us pray with you You are not in this alone. We are a family walking together through this. You don't have to be a member of this church to be a part of the first family. But this day is the one that you've been given to find someone to help you, to stabilize your heart, and to help you see something that maybe you missed. Perhaps you need to be a part of the first family. You want to. I want you to do the same thing. Text the name Jesus to 315-0092. One of our ministers will be in touch with you. You tell them you want to join this church, we'll hook you up. One last thing. One of the things that the church is called to be is a place for people to take the next step spiritually. For some of you, that's baptism. Two weeks from today, August 9th, we're gonna do a baptism service. We've not done one in months, but we're gonna do one then. If you're one who would say, I need to be in those waters, then here's what I want you to do. Same thing. Text the name Jesus to 315-0092. And you recognize today that this is the moment for which God has given you freedom. Let me pray over you. Spirit of the living God, I pray for your freedom in each life under the sound of my voice. Whether they're here in person or watching us on a live stream or a later broadcast, This is the day you have given us to do business with you. I pray for changed lives, Lord Jesus, changed hearts, and that you would reshape us from the inside out. I pray for courage for those who are holding their phones saying, I don't know, what's it gonna be like? Can I really let go of where I am? I pray, God, for freedom. Satan's gonna give us every reason to not do it. But I pray, Lord Jesus, for freedom, that life would come and that they would recognize the lies of the enemy and plunge ahead. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love for us, even as messed up and difficult as we are. So help us to love others the same way you loved us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.